So everybody, welcome to the Torah portion for this week. This week, the very last Parsha of the Torah, the Zot HaVarcha, and this is the blessing. It's really neat how the very last portion of the Torah is all about blessing and all about uh, restoration, going into the land, fulfilling the promise, and we find some prophetic events happening in here as well. So we're going to take a look at just a couple of these things today, and uh, it's very relevant. You know, the, the, the Torah we often look at as just a, a book for the time past, and well, it was written to a people of a different culture. We have it live in a different culture today, but here's the thing. The nature of man is the same. We all think the same way. We all act the same way. Technology changes. Styles and fashion changes. Cultures have differing things, but the word of the living God is eternal. And so we are uh, seeking his heart in all things in all ways, right? So we are partaking of a blessing when we seek the Father in his heart and his ways, his word, learn to walk in that. And uh, we say we want the blessings of God, right? We want the things that uh, God wants to give us. We want the blessings that he desires for us. But a lot of these blessings say, walk in my ways and you'll get this blessing. See, so we've got to learn to walk in his ways. And we're going to take a look at a few things here today, okay? Um, let's just start off with a quick reading of the, of the verse, uh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. We know it's chapters 33 and 34. Um, so chapter 33, verse 1 says, V'zot ha'vracha asher barach Moshe ish ha'elohim et b'nei Yisrael lifnei moto. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So we see this as much like back in uh, the end of Bereshit, the end of Genesis, where Yaakov is blessing his sons. He's blessing the 12 tribes. And it's believed that before a person passes and he gives this blessing to the next generation, that a spirit of prophecy comes upon him. And that's, that's pertinent to what we have in this parsha today, because uh, Moshe, who saw Yahweh, he, he, he saw Elohim, and he, uh, he received words of life from him, and he received instruction. So here, he's equated with the spirit of prophecy in that. And I'll get to that in a minute. But we, I want to emphasize, though, that there is a blessing here that is given to each of the tribes and Israel as a whole. And that's what we want to take a look at. OK, um, so, again, before the, the, the patriarchs passed on, they gave a blessing to the next generations. And this blessing wasn't just a uh, desire of, of what they want to happen. It was a it was a blessing of what the father wanted to happen. All right, so Deuteronomy 33, 1, and this is the blessing where Moshe, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Now, the interesting thing here is that he is called the man of Elohim, Isha Elohim, the man of Elohim. This is the very first time Moshe was called the man of Elohim, which is uh, noteworthy, right? The very first use of the phrase Isha Elohim is here in Devarim 33, 1, and the very last use is in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We know it's not going to be, you know, the Hebrew Isha Elohim, but the phrase man of Elohim, man of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that, look at this, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So Isha Elohim, the man of Elohim, is one who has uh, submitted himself to the Father, and it, it is believed the spirit of prophecy flowing through him as well. And uh, here he's giving the blessings for all Israel. And what we see in uh, Timothy is that it is given here for all the tribes together, all working together, that the man of Elohim may be what? Perfect and for every good work. In other words, everything that was given in the word to come before, okay? Everything that the Father had desired, he is equipping us to walk in that. And we have to learn to walk in his ways, okay? So again, Moses, the man of Elohim, again, this is prophet terminology, and this is the only place that Moshe is called the man of Elohim. And what do I, what do I mean by prophet terminology? I mean, uh, here's an example, 1 Kings 13, it says, Behold, Isha Elohim came out of Judah by the word of Yahweh to Bethel. Yeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. There's a confrontation that happens there. Won't get into that right now. 1 Kings 17, 18, and uh, she said to Eliyahu, What have you against me, O Isha Elohim, that you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance? Okay, Psalm 90, verse 1. Again, this is 
is speaking of Moshe again, a psalm, tefillah, or a prayer, le Moshe of, of Moses, Isha Elohim. And uh, so these are the things that we're looking at, the desire of Isha Elohim, the desire of the man of God. So does that mean that these are not Yahweh's desires? This is only Moses' desires? Well, if we do believe that Moshe was working in the spirit of prophecy, which I do believe he was, that he saw Yahweh, and I do believe he did, that he uh, received instruction directly from the mouth of Yah. Remember, mouth to mouth, I speak with him as, as Yahweh had declared. Um, so if all of these are true, so could Moshe be speaking from his heart, but yet we see the scripture where it says to ask whatever you desire it will be given to you, but this is when your heart becomes the father's heart. Everything that the Father desires, you are becoming that. So in other words, you're becoming like him. You're surrendering yourself, becoming like your God, be, having that word written on your heart to be more like him day by day by day. Okay. So yeah, I do believe this is Moshe's desires, but I do believe that Yahweh is also opening things up for him to see how things are moving ahead. Okay. So again, let's take a look at this. Deuteronomy 33, 4 says the Torah Moshe commanded us as an inheritance for the community of Yaakov. I want to look at this phrase, the community of Yaakov. It's Kehilat Yaakov in the Hebrew. And uh, the Pentateuch by Samson Raphael Hirsch uh, in Deuteronomy speaks up this way. It says, the teaching is the national heritage. The land and the power are only conditional consequences of this treasure. In other words, so so what is that that was given as an inheritance or as a heritage to Israel? Is it just the land? I don't believe it is just the land. I believe it is the teaching, and the land is the is a benefit of that. Now, we see scriptures where it says, so you go into this land, and if you do what I say, then you'll be prosperous and blessed in the land that I am giving you. But at the same time, we see that if they do not keep the word of Yahweh in the land, the land will spew them out. Okay, so the blessing of the land is also fixed or dependent on the blessing of the Torah, the blessing of walking in the promise and learning to walk in his ways. All right, let's go back to what the, uh, Raphael Hirsch has to say about this. So he says that the phrase Kehelat Yaakov is vocative. It is Kehela, not Kahol. Okay, Kahal or Kahol. Okay, a lot of times when you hear this, kahol is an assembly or a congregation, okay? So kahol is given there. But in this instance, it's kehilat, which is the um, assembly of, okay? So this is kehilat that is given here, not kahol, kehilat. And this is, this is a commentary on that. Only there in this single instance is the Jewish community called kehilat. Elsewhere, it is independence always referred to as kahol Israel, not to individuals, but to the community as a whole, God has entrusted his Torah as a heritage. For only the community lives forever, and only the community has means for everything. Now, what I want to say about this is um, it says that, the, that the, the Torah was given to the community of Israel. That does not mean that us as individuals do not have to walk it out. Because how does the community at large walk in the word of Yahweh? The individuals have to walk in the word individually separately so the result is they are walking it out together in a community in other words you can't have a community that's walking in the word of yahweh if all the individuals within that community none of them are walking in the word of yahweh so in order for the community to be walking in the word of yahweh us as individuals need to be walking in the word of yahweh but the word of yahweh was not given for just one individual to be able to walk in, to, to, to interpret, and to be able to, uh, to have final say in that. Remember, Yahweh spoke with Moshe face to face, and he, or mouth to mouth, literally, and he said that uh, he doesn't speak to anyone else like this. Okay? And so we have to learn that the Torah was given. Moshe explained and expounded this to us, but at the same time, we as an individual, no one person has full final right and say on what exactly the Torah has to say. It was given to the community of Yaakov. So again, there is a final say. Yahweh has the final say. His Ruach HaKodesh has the final say. There are people who he has appointed and entrusted to. There's people who were trained in the Torah. But our warning behind this is we can't say someone who has just come to the realization that uh, the Torah is relevant for my life. They've studied it for a month, and now they, they believe they are a final authority in everything the Torah has to say. 
um, no, that's very dangerous territory to to be dwelling in. Okay, we can't we can't have that. Okay, so again, there are people who have to be trained and instructed, and that's why the Leviim were given. The Leviim were to be trained and instructed in how to handle the word and how to teach the word and pass it on. Okay, from generation to generation to generation. Right? Peter kind of helps us a little bit. He puts it this way: Second Peter one nineteen to twenty one says. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which uh, you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own or private interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Ruach HaKodesh. So again, even the prophets uh, had submitted themselves to Yahweh and were to speak only what they were given to speak. They were not to speak their own words, their own interpretations, their own ideas, and say, thus says Yahweh. They were not to do that. They were only to speak according to what they were given instruction to say. Now, add to this that many of the prophets were Levites, okay, which meant they would have been trained in the, uh, in the order of the Levi'im. They would have been trained in how to handle the Word of God. They would have been trained in their service in regards to the Mishkan or the Temple. And they would have been trained in how to uh, get the Word, to handle the Word, to, to, to teach the Word, and to give instructions, and their responsibilities within all of that as well. Okay? So, again, this was not just, uh, you know, for the most part, just some random dude out there running around. All right? Uh, so what about John the Baptist? Even he was a Levite, guys. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, there's just different things we need to make sure we're paying attention to. All right. The emphasis here is that the word of Yahweh is meant to be walked and lived by an individual, but within a community. Okay, we need to see ourselves as part of a body. Uh, we are not isolated unto ourselves. We, we need to understand we are part of a whole. We are not separate from Yahweh or his people. We are separate from the world in the ways of it, right? Even Eliyahu fell into this trap. He said, oh, I've tried to do all these things and I'm alone. And Yahweh said, you're not alone, right? And so we need to understand the same thing for us. You're not alone, but uh, don't fall into the trap thinking you've got the only answer, okay? Yahweh is still speaking to his people today. His word is still relevant. We need to learn to find the other people here that Yahweh is wanting us to join together with and to be part of that community and that body that we're supposed to be, okay? Um, one body together, working together towards the common goal, right? Not pieces or factions of the body spread out all over the world or divided and refusing to get together. I mean, if the hand refuses to be attached to the wrist, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. OK, so again, we, we need to learn to function as part of that body together. Uh, a couple scriptures here. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. I do believe we see the day approaching, guys. Um, when we start to separate from one another, we start to see each other as valuable and relevant, and as a part of our very lives. In other words, we stop seeing each other as family. We stop seeing each other as brothers and sisters and people of the Most High, but we start to see, no, I'm I myself. No, it's not you yourself. You are part of a, a, a larger p a grouping of people here. So it's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. That's one bride, not a whole bunch of brides, okay? It means we all need to learn to function as one grouping together. We also see in Ephesians 2, it says that at that time you were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were far off are brought nigh by the blood of Messiah. So again, we who were far away in the Messiah have been brought near to what? Now remember context of everything here, right? You would say brought near to God and you would be correct, okay? But what exactly and specifically in that does he say? Well, we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, which means in the Messiah we are brought near to be a, a part of, joined with the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, 
We are not disassociated from Israel. We are not replacing Israel. But we are brought in to be a joint heirs with Israel. In other words, brothers. Okay, back to this community of Yaakov we're going to look at. The community of Yaakov will be all Israel. And we find, as we go back in the Torah, uh, that Yaakov is prophesied to be a community of nations. Yaakov is prophesied, I'm going to say it again, Yaakov is prophesied to be a community of nations. In other words, people from all nations gathering together to be part of one community. All right, where does it say that? Let's, let's go look at it. Uh, Genesis 35, 10 and 11, God said to him, your name is Yaakov, and no longer shall your name be called Yaakov, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. Look at this, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from your own body. Now, when it says a nation and a company of nations, that is the phrase goy, ukachal, goyim. Now, we, we may have heard this phrase, goy means pagan. Goy does not mean pagan. Goy means nations. Okay, so by implication, you can say pagan because there's, there's Israel, the God of Israel, who is in covenant together, right? And then there are the nations who do not serve the God of Israel. So by default, they're pagan. Okay, um, they're, they're not of the nation belonging in covenant with Yahweh. Okay, so you could say that, but literally, goy means nations. So there are going to be people of the nations who will be gathered, kahal, gathered together to be a, a community who will be called by the name Israel. All right, let's go back, take another look at this. The word kahal is a congregation or an assembly together. Okay, now let's fast forward a little bit to Genesis 48, 19, when it talks about the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh, when Yaakov is blessing uh, Jacob's or sorry, Jacob, when Yaakov is, is, is blessing uh, Yosef's sons, okay, Ephraim and Manasseh, he's blessing his sons, and he gives a blessing to Manasseh, he gives a blessing to Ephraim, and he gives a, a greater blessing to Ephraim, and he puts his right hand uh, over Ephraim's head, he had crossed his hands to do so, and uh, Yosef says, Dad, you're, you've got the wrong kid here, and, and, uh, and, 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 and Yaakov says, I know what I'm doing, son. And he corrects him and he prophesies to him. What does he say? Let's look at him. 48, 19 of, of Bereshit. And his father refused said, I know, son, I know. He will also, speaking of Manasseh, will become a people and he also will be great. However, his younger brother will be greater than he and his seed will become the multitude of nations. He's saying his seed will become Maloha Goyim, the ones that fill the nations. And again, we see how there is a, a disbursement or a scattering of all Israel because uh, remember the, in Jeroboam and Rehoboam, uh, when Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, there are 10 tribes of the northern kingdom, uh, two in the southern, again, the Leviim don't count, there were Leviim throughout all Israel. And so here of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes that were dispersed into all the nations, the head of which was Yeroboam, was, which was from the tribe of Ephraim, who had descended from Yosef, right? So again, we see that of Ephraim, he shall become Maloha Goyim. He shall become that which completely fills all the nations. All right. So th this is something that we need to make note of because it says that Jacob will become an assembly of nations. So what's going to happen when these nations go out? Well, there's going to be a calling back. And when there is a calling back, there are going to be those in the nations that are going to come back and return with him to serve the one true God, the God of Israel. All right. Now let's keep looking through the scripture uh, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 33. The very next verse, Deuteronomy 33, 5, we were in verse 4, says, Then a king arose in Yeshurun, which means uh, upright ones. The king arose in Yeshurun when the leaders of the people were gathered. Look at this. The leaders of the people and all the tribes of Israel together. In other words, when we see when the one true king arises among Israel, he will gather 
all the tribes together, all the tribes back. Interesting thing about Jubilee, you know, the years of Jubilee. Um, it says when the Jubilee is proclaimed, all Israel is to return back to their homeland, back to their heritage, back to their inheritance, and to return back to their home place. And so Jubilee cannot truly be pronounced until all the tribes return back home. And when you understand Yeshua says, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he told his uh, Talmudim to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he tries to gather all these together. Uh, J John chapter 11, again, uh, Caiaphas speaking. And he's saying that it is expedient that one man should die, not just for this nation, Israel, but those, the children of God who were scattered abroad as well. So who who is this? Again, this is what Yeshua has done to gather in all tribes all nations, all together, but understanding that there are those of Israel who is dispersed into all the world, scattered as seeds all over the world, that when Yahweh calls, there will be those to rise up and answer that call, to return to their heritage, return to their inheritance, and when they do, there will be those from the nations who will come out and be joined with them in, in returning to the Lord their God, okay? Uh, let's look at let's look at something very interesting here. I'm going to talk about Yahut Shmoni, which is a compilation of older interpretations and explanations of biblical passages. It's arranged according to the sequence of the portions of the Bible to which they referred, circa 13th century. So this is a 13th century uh, understanding of uh, of what the scriptures have to say. Okay, well let's take a look at it in Yahut Shmoni. It says. The Gentile nations will bring their Jewish inhabitants to the King Messiah as a present. These Jews, because they will be skeptical about their Jewish origin, in other words, they will not know they are part of Israel, is what this is saying, will not want to appear before the Messiah and will prefer instead to go their own ways. At that point, the Messiah will identify them individually, saying, this one is Israel, this one is a Kohen, this one is a Levi. Uh, understand what's going on here. He's saying he will identify each person and what tribe they are a part of. Okay, what tribe they are setting in and to be a part and example with, all right? Uh, it also states that the Messiah will also identify as Jewish many of the individuals who will bring the Jews back to him, thinking themselves as Gentiles. He will identify their origins as either Kohanim, uh, Le Le Levites, or Israelites, and will even accept them accordingly for service in the Holy Temple. Uh, again, these are, these are things we're looking at. So we're talking about the understanding of a return from the nations and a coming back before our king and him dividing us out uh, for tribes and inheritance we're giving. And think about this for one second. In the New Jerusalem, there are 12 gates. What names are over the gates? Yeah, the tribes of Israel gathering in, right? We talk about uh, the two sticks becoming one. But in the two sticks, that's four groupings of people, guys, because it talks about uh, Yosef, which is Ephraim, and those joined with him, and, and the tribe of Yehuda, and those joined with him, all coming together to form one, okay? again And again, these are just things you, we just really take a good look at, okay? Um, Zechariah 8.23 it says, thus says Yahweh Savaot, in those days, ten men from the nations, look at this, from every tongue, shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, normally when it speaks of the nations, it talks about 70. Well, here it says ten men from the nations, all languages from the nations, right? So how can you have ten men representing 70 nations? It's only ten men. I mean, at least it would be 70 men, Right? So why 10 men from the nations? Because, again, the 10 tribes that were scattered into all the world because of idolatry, because of uh, rebellion to Yahweh, they were scattered into all the world. They became assimilated into all the nations, forgot who they were. And Yahweh says there's going to come a time when he's going to call those from the nations back. And he says they will grab hold of one who is a Jew saying, we will go with you, for we have heard God is with you. That is Yeshua HaMashiach. That is our Messiah. And it, it grab hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. That What's on the skirt of a Jew? The hem of a, of a garment from a Jew? The Sitziot. Okay? Again, which represent keeping the word of God, walking in his ways, and not walking according to our own ways. So in other words, for the nations will come and return to the Lord their God, and when they do, they are coming back 
to uh, his covenant and back to the place that he has given to us. Remember the, the covenant, Jeremiah talks about the new covenant that we are given is the Torah written on your heart. Not something different written on your heart. Not serving some other God. Not saying, oh, I'm the God of the Old Testament, but when, uh, uh, but when this new covenant happens, you're going to have a different God and I'm going to be replaced. No, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he is the God of Israel, he remains the God of Israel. Okay, uh, let's take a look at this. In Bereshit Rabbah, uh, the Midrash uh, of Haggadol of Genesis 49.11, it says, Through Mashiach shall be effected the ingathering of all the exiles of Israel. Mashiach, the principle of Mashiach and the Messianic era in Jewish law and tradition expanded edition, speaks of the belief in Mashiach by uh, Rabbi Yaakov Emmanuel Shochet, and he says this, the belief in the coming of Mashiach and the Messianic redemption is one of the fundamental principles of the Jewish faith. Every Jew must believe that Mashiach will arise and restore the kingdom of David to its original state and sovereignty, rebuild the Beit Hamikdash, gather the dispersed of Israel, and in his days all the laws of the Torah shall be reinstituted as they had been aforetimes. So again, we're talking about a restoration, a gathering in from all the nations, coming back home, guys. Let me put it this way, return to Gan Eden, return to the garden, return to a perfect paradise that Yahweh has created and restored for us, right? Um, look at this, in the Talmud, now guys, before I do this, I always do a disclaimer on, on what I believe in the Talmud, the Mishnah, and these other uh, books. I don't consider them an actual part of Scripture. However, it does give us great insight to the thoughts and the beliefs at, of the time when they were written. Okay, it's, It would be no different than us buying a commentary to Scripture today or uh, picking up a, a book at a bookstore and reading through it. It's, it's just our, uh, someone's thoughts and beliefs and commentary of the day. Okay, uh, Same scenario here. People who have studied to the, the, the Torah, people who have studied a, a, a lot of the, lived their life, in the study of the Torah and laying down and preserving the Torah. These are some of their thoughts and some of the things that they have had. Okay. So in the Talmud, the Sanhedrin equate of the exile of the lost tribes being morally and spiritually lost. In Tractate Sanhedrin uh, 110b, Rabbi Eliezer states, just like a day is followed by darkness and light later returns, so too, although it will become dark for the ten tribes, God will ultimately take them out of their darkness. In other words, to make them dark means to be moved away from the light, which he is the light, right? Like Yeshua says, I am the light of the world, right? John chapter one, he is the light that was life. He is the light that was in the beginning, right? So here we are. He says that uh, though their light is removed, though they forget the Messiah, he says that they will be returned. Their light will be brought back to them. In other words, they will return and come back home and they will be restored. Again, we're talking about a restoration of all the tribes. Okay, don't forget Deuteronomy 33, 5 specifically states that all the tribes of Israel will be together. And look at a couple things here. Nehemiah 8, 1. It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Again, we're talking about gathering together as one person and to hear the word of the Lord. When we return to Yahweh, we need to hear his voice. We need to hear his word and uh, the, those, that life that he has given us, the word that he has given us. We need to learn to walk in his ways. So if we return to him, we must learn what he says, right? Okay. Uh, Psalm 147, 2 says, Yahweh builds up Yerushalayim. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. Isaiah uh, 11 Verses 10 through 12 says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as an ensign for the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Look at this, how the nations seek this sign that is the root of Jesse, right? And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh, that the Lord, shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamat, and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an instant for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Notice the difference. He will be gathering together Israel 
and uh, uh, Judah. And, and so these together, Judah is one tribe of the 12. Israel, the northern kingdom, is often referred to collectively as Israel. All Israel would be all the tribes back in together. Okay, so again, there is a, a bringing back those that were cast into the earth, bringing them all back in together. And this is going to be done by the sign, which is the root of Jesse, that is going to be lifted up that shall call all the nations to him. Mm. Even, even those who uh, say they have no place in here, if they are willing to serve Yahweh, to surrender to him, they have a place. Uh, Isaiah continues in chapter 56. Uh, thus says Yahweh, keep judgment, do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this and the son of man that lays hold on it. Does what? Keeps Shabbat from polluting it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that he has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Verse 5. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahweh, to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone that keeps Shabbat from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And the Lord God, which gathers the outcast of Israel, says, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are also that are already gathered in. Now, you've heard this phrase, my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. But where else have you heard this? In the context, this is where it was being quoted from, in the context of, uh, of people surrendering themselves to join themselves to a people who serve the one true God. Keep Shabbat walk in his covenants, walk in his ways. That's being joined with the covenant that Yahweh had given with Israel and, and, and being put in his place. How can we come before him from all nations and all tribes? He's calling us back. He's calling us to return home. And again, whether we are uh, this, uh, part of this scattered Israel or whether we are uh, joining in with natural born descendants or those just being joined with, you have a place to, to return to a covenant that Yahweh has made that is eternal covenant. Okay? Jeremiah 31.10 says, Hear the words of Yahweh, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Why would it say, Hear nations, he that gathers Israel? Because where is Israel scattered? Into all the nations. Okay? Ezekiel 11.16 Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them a little sanctuary in the countries where they have come. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people, assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Hosea 1.10 says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Israel. So again, we're talking about Judah and Israel being connected and joined together. And in that, then they will all be joined under one king, one shepherd. All right. Uh, they will all be all come back and serve the one true God. Okay. So continuing with some of these blessings, I'm going to look at the blessing for Judah and the blessing for uh, Joseph here. Okay. Because we're talking about a return in Judah and we're talking about blessing for Joseph as well. Right. So let's look at this. The blessing for Judah. Part of it says Deuteronomy 33, 7. Of Yehuda, he said, Hear Adonai, the cry of Yehuda. Bring him into his people. Let his own hands defend him, but you help him against his enemies. Now, does this make sense? Bring Judah into Judah. 
No, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Uh, and again, interpretation issues, right? Um, so bring Judah to Judah, or does it say something else? I believe it says something else. We look in the Hebrew, it literally says, the El Amo, and that's, and, and toward, toward his people, okay? Tivienu is bring us. Bo is the, the root word. Tivienu, bring us. So literal reading is near or among his people, bring us. So the idea is that all the tribes be brought in to be near with Judah. All the tribes come in and be brought near to the tribe of Judah. How does this happen? Let's look in Romans, Romans 11. 17 says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree, then don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember that you are not supporting the root, but the root supports you. Romans 11, 23 and 24 says, Moreover, the others, if they do not persist in their lack of trust, will be grafted in, because God is able to graft them back in. For if you who were cut out of what is by nature the wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? I, I, again, this is what we're looking at. We're talking about being part of that olive tree, being part of that tree coming in together, being part of all this. Well, this is Israel, guys. This is part of the covenant that Yahweh has given to Israel. I forget what we said back in Zechariah, that the nations will come to the one who is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard God is with you. And it is the ten from the nations will come and grab hold of that one man, which I do believe is Yeshua. Let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, so there is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12 says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Messiah. Again, we need to understand we are part of a single body, all right? One part of a single assembly, the people of Yahweh. All right, so let's look at uh, the blessing for Yosef. Deuteronomy 33, 13 to 17 says, And of Yosef, he says, Blessed by Yahweh be his land, with the choicest gifts of heaven above, and of the deep that crouches beneath, and with the choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the months, with the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills. Verse 16, With the best gifts of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwells in the bush, uh -huh, with a burning bush, remember that? May these rest on the head of Yosef and the pate of him who is the prince among his brothers. A firstborn bull, he has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox, and with them he shall gore the peoples, all of them to the ends of the earth, and they are, the, they are what? The ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So I want to look at this phrase. It says, blessed by Yahweh be his land with it says, the choicest gifts of heaven. The Hebrew is mimeged shemaim. Mimeged. Meged is the word I want to take a quick look at. And again, the Pentateuch by Samson Raphael Hirsch I want to share with you. Uh, Samson Hirsch has done a lot of study in the Hebrew language itself. Um, he, he's got a breakdown of the words of the Hebrew, the etymological roots of the Hebrew word. So sometimes we, we have a word, but we kind of misunderstand some of the meaning behind it. Well, uh, Raphael Hirsch is look, looking at the etymological root of these words and what they represent, which brings us an interesting understanding here of what's being said. All right, let's take a look at it. So the root of Magad could also be uh, Geda, which is related to Geda. You see that with an Ein, which is the root of Gedi, which means a fruit detached from the body of its origin. Think about this for a second. A fruit uh, a, a, a fruit detached from the body of its origin. So we have fruit, which the name Yosef, right, uh, means to add. Ephraim is to be fruitful. Menashe means forgetting. So we have in Yosef a picture of, of those that were scattered into the nations. They've been fruitful, but they forgot who they are. So Yahweh is, is in all these nations will be added to him and brought back as part of this return. They'll be fruitful, but they are separated from their origin. We are separated from uh, Yahweh. 
And so in, in, in this, they're going to call him back home. They're going to call him back in. Let's keep reading. The rich abundance is only granted to the sons of Yosef in the assumption that they will remember their forefather who showed himself modest and humane in the midst of glory and riches, who, even in his youth, did not let himself be entrapped by the snares of sensuality. And uh, that now again, again, Raphael Hirsch, where he talks about to the ends of the earth, they are the ten thousands of Ephraim. He says these will primarily be formed under his leadership by the tens of thousands of thousands of the tribes of Yosef. So again, we have a picture of all these tribes being brought in, joined with Ephraim, and being brought back into a place of being joined with Judah to be joined and created as one new man, the body of the living God, to serve the God of Israel, to serve the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Again, we're talking about a covenant place of eternal, learning to walk in his ways, right? So uh, Deuteronomy 34, I'm going to kind of end up on this, Deuteronomy 34. So Moshe went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And Yahweh showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan and all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea. So that's an interesting phrase, unto the utmost sea, right? Yahweh, I believe, supernaturally gave him the ability to see beyond what he could see, not just like physically, he could just see for miles, right? I believe to see beyond what he could see, to see what was there physically, and to see what was there spiritually as well. Talking about the scattering of all Israel because of rebellion, but yet a gathering in of all the tribes to a, back to a place of unity of heart, right? Under the Yetmosi sea is the phrase Hayam Ha'acharon, which means the end of the sea, but it can also read Hayom Ha'acharon, which means the end of days. So when Moshe is, is here and he's prophesying to all the tribes of Israel, talking about all the tribes being scattered and being gathered back in, talking about them all being one, talking about them all having a place with one king, and they're going into the land, they have a heritage, which is the word of the living God, all of this working together in the latter days. And if you look through the rest of the book of Deuteronomy, you see in Devarim chapter 4, where it talks about I've, you know, the blessing and the curse that I have set before you, you'll, you'll in wherever you're going to be scattered to, in all the lands, you're going to recall the blessing and the curse, and you're going to come back to the Lord your God, and you're going to obey his voice then, you know, at that time. Uh, all of that. In Deuteronomy 29 and 30, we talk about a scattering of all Israel and being brought back in. We see the prophecy of, uh, of Yosef uh, that was given to Ephraim and Manasseh at the end of the book of Bereshit. We saw this being a, a scattering of all in, into all the nations, Maloha Goyim, which uh, Rav Shaul talks about in Romans. He says that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until Maloha Goyim return. Until the, the, those who filled the nations come back and return. And it, so all of this is working together to a place of restoration and a place of showing the heart of the Father. His heart is revealed in his word. We've got to learn to walk in it. We've got to learn to keep his ways. And I, this comes to the point of now as we're finishing out the book, we roll the scroll back again and start over again. The idea is as we come to the end or the latter days or the very end of the word there, we start to see a new beginning. Because only in Yahweh is the end of something truly a new beginning, right? Think of the book of Revelation, guys. Uh, at the end of all things is not the end. It's just the beginning of eternity. And so this is what the Father is telling us and showing us. His heart truly is restoration. His heart is to bring us all in to be a people together and to be gathered in as one in Messiah. Wow. What an amazing thing to see. Uh, it's showing the heart of Yahweh, right? All right. Blessings to you all. I hope this has been encouraging to you. I hope this has been a challenge to you as well. Okay, so uh, until next time, shalom.